Hello, and thank you for joining this uh, IMEC -E webinar. My name is Mark Wilson. Uh, I'm the current chair of the IMEC -E Thermofluids Group, with just a few words of introduction before I hand over to our, our speaker. Uh, the Thermofluids Group is a, a group of uh, industrial and academic members with interest in all aspects of industrial fluid and thermal systems. Our role includes advising the IMEC -E in this area and contributing to the technical strategy but our main activity is in developing and delivering seminars, conferences and events like today's webinar um, to highlight and share advances and capabilities relevant to key industrial applications. If you're interested in finding out more about the Thermofluids Group, do please get in touch through the IMEC -E contacts you've had for this webinar. Today's speaker is Chris Ward and I'm very grateful to him for developing this webinar. Uh, Chris joined Fraser Nash 10 years ago after completing his PhD in pressure gain combustion gas turbine cycles at the Whittle Lab at the University of Cambridge. He now leads Fraser Nash's offshore technology group, uh, which provides fluid dynamics, heat transfer and acoustics technical services to the defense, offshore energy and commercial marine markets. Chris specializes in the use of computational fluid dynamics modeling to, to assess and understand the airflow around structures and offshore platforms and the implications that this has on the safe operating limits for both rotary and fixed wing aircraft. He's also helped to develop specialist engineering flight simulators that allow pilots to test and the safe operating limits of aircraft when operating around helidecks and that's what he's going to be talking to us about today. I hope you find the webinar interesting and useful do please feel free to ask questions uh, using the ask a question box within this presentation interface. Uh, this can be done at any time during the talk. And then at the end, I will put the questions to the speaker on your behalf. So thank you again for joining us. And I'll now hand over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I'll just share these slides. So. Uh, hopefully you can all see that someone shout if you can't um so uh as mark said um my name's chris ward uh, and i look after fraser nash's offshore technology uh, team um i've been at fraser nash about 10 years and over that time i've been uh, quite heavily involved in a lot of our work supporting safe operations uh, of helidex for a number of navies uh, and also offshore energy operators uh, around the world uh, and, and obviously today's talk is based on a lot of a lot of that experience um, so I just wanted to give you a quick high level overview uh, of this talk before we kick off. Um, we'll start off with a bit of background uh, and introducing some of the key concepts that you're going to need to be aware of. Uh, we'll then go on to talk a little about the benefits uh, and challenges uh, of some flight simulators. Uh, and then we're going to dive into a little bit more detail uh, around how we can model something called the pilot workload, uh, which we're going to introduce in a little bit. Uh, and then we'll start uh, a little section on looking at um, measuring the wing conditions. Uh, and as we'll see, that's actually quite a key uh, question that we need to be able to answer in order to be able to actually make use uh, of our modeling and simulation work. Uh, and finally, we're going to finish up by looking at uh, what are the future developments in this space and where are things heading for the next kind of five or 10 years. Um, I just wanted to start by talking briefly about some of the different applications of offshore helidex because it really does uh, extend across a number of different industries. Uh, and the first one I wanted to touch on was obviously naval ships. Uh, so Navy, uh, navies around the world make use of, of helicopters um, and that might be to transfer goods uh, or, or people between ships or between the ship and the shore. Um, but obviously helicopters also play a key role in a lot of naval activities uh, as well. So things like submarine hunting is a really key one where, where helicopters are really important. Uh, moving on from the Navy, you then kind of got the oil and gas um, industry uh, and oil and gas rigs uh, tend to be located a, a reasonable way offshore. Uh, while you can get to them sometimes with a small boat, it's not generally a very kind of pleasant journey. So you tend to get people on and off those platforms uh, via helicopter. Uh, staying in the oil and gas domain, you have things called floating production storage and off offloading vessels or FPSOs. Uh, so these are no another oil and gas asset. Um, but unlike kind of the traditional oil and gas rig, which is probably uh, fixed to the sea floor, these tend to be big floating barges. Uh, so they move around a bit. Um, uh, but again, you use helidex to get people to and from those generally. Uh, 
uh, you then move into kind of a luxury yacht space. Uh, and again, they tend to have heli decks. Uh, either that might be for a, a kind of commercial yacht that you might rent out or even a, a high net worth individual. Uh, then you have kind of the cruise ships and a lot of cruise ships nowadays tend to have a heli deck uh, somewhere, somewhere on them. That ten, tends to be for medical evacuations, uh, for those emergency situations. And then this kind of final class of ship where I've just called research vessels, which again, uh, tend to have heli decks because it's quite handy to get stuff on and off that vessel while it's at sea. So that's, that's a really brief overview of kind of different um, applications. I then just wanted to touch on uh, some of the hazards of flying to and from offshore heli decks. Uh, and I, I quantify this with some because I'm sure I've, there's some which are missing here. Um, but the first one, the one that I kind of wanted to focus on uh, initially was this turbulent airflow. So a lot of these platforms, they're out in the open ocean. Uh, they tend to experience quite uh, high wind speeds. Uh, and as that wind starts to interact with the, uh, the platform, uh, you end up with lots of little vortex, uh, vortices being shed off the structure. And that can form quite a turbulent airflow over your heli deck. Uh, and that's a really key risk. Uh, and it, as you'll see later on in this, this talk, it is a really important one. Another key risk is around exhaust plumes, and this is particularly important for the oil and gas type industry. Uh, and on these platforms, you might have uh, gas turbines, you might have diesel generators, uh, you might be flaring just some unburnt hydrocarbons. And so you end up with all these hot, hot exhaust plumes. Uh, and if you were to ingest some of those hot exhaust plumes into your engine, uh, it's not very good for your engine and it poses quite a big risk. So you tend to want to avoid that. Uh, another risk, which we'll touch on a little bit in this talk, uh, is around moving heli decks. So, as we've as we've mentioned, some of these platforms are floating, uh, and when you've got a floating platform, that heli deck can move. Uh, and one of the risks here is you might imagine you're coming in to land on your heli deck, and then suddenly a big wave comes along, and the heli deck starts coming up to meet you, and you hit the deck a lot harder than you think you're going to, uh, and you can damage all sorts of like kind of landing gear equipment that way. Uh, another risk, um, which is perhaps most applicable to kind of your big aircraft carriers where you might have multiple aircraft operating, uh, is around rotor downwash. So you might have one helicopter uh, on your deck that's about to take off, uh, is producing a, a really big downwash, uh, and that might then impact on another helicopter somewhere else on the deck that is uh, trying to do something else. Uh, and then finally, just to round this off, I wanted to, to mention that actually a lot of these operations uh, are often being done in fairly poor visibility. So you might be operating at night um, or you might just be operating in some really uh, cloudy, rainy, grey skies or fog uh, where it's actually quite difficult to kind of see uh, exactly what you're doing. Um, I just wanted to mention, so obviously not all of these hazards, but a lot of them are aerodynamic in nature. Uh, and actually that means they're quite amenable to using kind of fluid dynamic um, techniques to kind of start to address some of them. Before I move on, I just did just want to cover our kind of first key concept, which we're going to come back to time and time again in this presentation. And it's this, this idea of pilot workload. Um, so the pilot workload is essentially a measure of how hard the pilot is having to work in order to control the aircraft. Um, and all those hazards that we've just talked about, the turbulence, the moving heli deck, uh, the exhaust plumes, all of those are things that the pilot is having to take account of, uh, correct for, uh, and maybe make some control inputs uh, to the aircraft in order to keep it under control. Uh, and if you look at um, kind of when accidents tend to happen, it, it tends to be as a result, not of one big incident. So it's not one big turbulent eddy that comes in uh, and impacts the aircraft and causes it to crash, but it's a buildup of all these different factors, all of them kind of vying for the pilot's attention um, and the pilot's kind of being spread a bit thin. And then eventually something else happens that just tips it over. Uh, and that's when you tend to start getting accidents happening. So the pilot workload, it's quite a, quite a, a very human factors, a little bit nebulous, um, but that's, that's a key concept that we're going to come back to later. So given that the pilot workload is so important, how might you go about working out what your safe operating limit is and where that limit of pilot workload is? Um, and this is uh, a, a typical approach that you'd see in a lot of uh, defense industries, so in the Navy, uh, and you would run what uh, basically a series of physical flight trials. And the way that works is you take your, your test pilot, uh, and these are your really experienced pilots that have been there, done that, and seen it all. Uh, 
and you basically take your test pilots and you put them in an aircraft and you put them on a ship and you basically say just give it a go uh give it a go and tell us how how you get on um, and so the pilot will typically kind of take off from the deck they'll do a little circuit and they'll come back around and land and then they'll give that um activity a rating and it depends on which scale you use kind of the, the details of that rating but it effectively goes from uh, that was really easy anyone could do that all the way through to that was really dangerous don't let anyone try that again and somewhere in the middle of that scale uh, is the kind of that's about the safe operating limit for a standard naval pilot uh, and in the navy you, you, that's what you do you, you run a series of these trials and you try and work out where that boundary is um, one of the challenges of course uh, is that you have to repeat those trials for all the possible conditions that you might end up trying to operate in uh, when you're out at sea so you would have to repeat these trials for different wind directions uh, and different wind speeds uh, and actually just a point on that is it's the relative wind speed and direction that's really interesting here so the relative wind speed to, to the heli deck so a ship that's traveling forward at 25 knots in a on a still day produces a very similar air wake uh, to uh, a ship that is stationary with a 25 knot wind over it um, so you'd have to do those tests for different wind conditions you might have different landing spots if you've got a big aircraft carrier. Uh, you might have different takeoff and approach paths that you need to consider. Uh, you might uh, be operating in different sea states with different types of heli deck motion. Uh, you might have different aircraft weights. So your aircraft might be really heavily loaded or lightly loaded. Uh, and again, you might be operating at day or night. So you have to do a huge number of these trials until you start to get that picture of where that safe limit is. Um, so this is a, it's a tried and tested method, as I said, uh, navies around the world effectively use this process to develop their operating limits. Um, but it, it's also got a few challenges with it. And there's two here that I really want to draw out. Uh, the first one is that it's really expensive um, and it's really expensive because obviously you, you need uh, some helicopters, you need a ship, you need pilots, uh, flight crew, all the rest of it and all the fuel and everything else. Um, and because it's very expensive, actually it's only really viable for those really high assurance industries uh, where there is kind of demonstrable value in finding the very edge of that safe operating envelope and that basically means defense so in defense if you can operate in a few more wind conditions that's really valuable um, actually if you're just an oil and gas operator with a heli deck do you really care about the very edge of that envelope probably not you just want to know what's safe um, the other real kind of challenge with physical flight trials is that obviously you can only perform them after the platform has been built. So you need a ship and you need a helicopter. And because you can't do it until both of, both of those things have been built, it's almost impossible to change that safe operating envelope. You just have to live with what you have. Um, and obviously that can potentially result in some, some uh, interesting challenges. So that leads us on then to actually how can modeling and simulation help us in this space? Uh, and there's two options that we're going to kind of look at in this talk. Um, the first one, um, which might be perhaps the most obvious, which is what if we were to develop a flight simulator and run some simulated trials to determine the pilot workload? So we'll, we'll basically mimic that whole physical flight trials process, but we'll do it in a flight simulator. That's one approach that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the other approach uh, is actually what if we could develop a kind of a proxy for the pilot workload and then use that proxy to uh, assess how difficult we think it's going to be and actually we could probably assess that then with just modeling a simulation uh, or indeed some testing if we wanted to uh, and we'll come on to talk about that in a bit so um flight simulators um just briefly recapping on those two uh two real challenges of physical trials um first one being it's very expensive so obviously flight simulator trials are, are generally much, much cheaper than physical trials. Uh, typically you'd think in kind of an order of magnitude. Um, and of course, uh, unlike physical flight trials, you can do flight simulator trials during the design, which makes it much easier to address any issues if there are any um, uh, before everything's been built. So flight simulators are great. They've got some really nice benefits to them, um, but they aren't without their challenges uh, themselves. And I think Ultimately, the key challenge here with a flight simulator uh, is that in order for that flight simulator to be of any use at all, it really needs to look and feel like the real thing to an experienced pilot. Um, because if it doesn't look and feel like the real thing, um, then your pilot might try it and they might give you a, an estimate of the workload, but it's not really going to be a real representation of uh, what that's actually going to be in, in reality. 
And there's a huge number of factors that play into that um, looking and feeling like the real thing. There's a whole talk to be had around uh, making sure the visuals are just right and the motion feedback is right. And even down to the extent of is your pilot wearing the same outfit and helmet that in the simulator that he would be wearing uh, in, in the physical trials. Um, I guess for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily uh, on the kind of aerodynamic fluid dynamic challenges of making a simulator uh, feel like the real thing. Um, so if you look at a kind of typical flight simulator, a more traditional flight simulator, um, it would typically look something like this. Um, and you'd start with your rotor dynamics model. Uh, and your rotor dynamics model effectively describes how your aircraft responds to certain inputs. Um, so you might have some wind conditions with some atmospheric turbulence. Um, that will feed into your rotor dynamics model that might cause the helicopter to respond in a particular way. Uh, that information will get fed back to the pilot in the form of visuals uh, or indeed some motion feedback. And the pilot will then respond with some control system inputs, which then get fed back into your kind of rotor dynamics model uh, and, the, and the aircraft will correct itself in the simulator. Um, but so that, that works great, generally speaking. But actually, in our case, there's a, a few more bits of physics which are missing from, from this situation, which we need to consider. And the first one of those uh, is what I'm going to call the air wake. Um, so the air wake uh, is effectively all the turbulence shed uh, around your platform, um, all the way the flow is, uh, the wind is interacting with that platform or that ship, uh, and all the complicated air flows that, that come out of that. And obviously your wind conditions will impact that air wake. So the, the wind speed and direction start to impact that air wake. And that air wake has an impact on your rotor dynamics. So all those little turbulent eddies start to impact the way that the, uh, the helicopter will respond. So you need to start capturing that in, in any kind of simulator where you want to look at uh, heli deck operations. But it gets slightly more complicated than that because uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, some of these uh, heli decks might be on uh, moving platforms, so you might have some ship motion. Uh, now, motion of heli deck in and of itself is an interesting challenge for the pilot, um, but also as that ship moves, it's going to change the way that that air wake looks. So there's an interaction there between ship motion and air wake, which you might then also need to kind of think about in your simulator. And uh, finally, there's another one, so rotor downwash. So because your helicopter is generally operating quite close to structures, you can end up with some really complicated interactions where the, the downwash from the helicopter impacts on the structure, which then starts to change the air wake. Um, and the first kind of real challenge uh, in this space then is which of these new physical mechanisms that we've just introduced are we going to try and model? which ones might we use a kind of rough approximation for and which ones are we just going to um, give up on because it's just too complicated or we don't think they matter anyway. Uh, that's a, very much a topic of ongoing research. There's lots of discussions going on in that space. Uh, a lot of it's limited by effectively computing power. Um, but for the kind of purposes of this talk, I, I'm going to focus very much on that Airwake one. So Airwake is a is a recognized as one of the really key key factors in understanding kind of a ship air uh, interface and, and heli deck operations. So how might you go about modeling this, this air wake uh, for a flight simulator? Um, well, one approach uh, that's used quite a lot is to use computational fluid dynamics simulations. So hopefully what you can see on the screen now is, is, a, is a computational fluid dynamics simulation of the Queen Elizabeth class carrier. Um, what you've got is wind coming in from ahead of a ship uh, and you can see that wind starting to impact on, on what we call the islands and the turbulent flow being shed off those islands and the wakes behind them and the turbulence then that occurs over the flight deck. Um, so the way this works in the flight simulator is you would develop your computational fluid dynamics model. You'd run your, your model for a range of kind of different wind conditions and you'd end up with uh, stuff that looks a bit like what we're showing on the screen now. And then effectively you just play that pre-recorded air wake data in the simulator for the pilot to fly through. Um, and again, this is a, a kind of tried and tested approach. It's been used in a number of simulators uh, very successfully um, and, it, and it works quite well. Um, it does in itself have some interesting modeling challenges. Um, and the first one of these is primarily around uh, the size uh, of these simulations. So we've talked around how big some of these platforms are, typically hundreds of meters. Um, because the platforms are so big, 
you need some really, really big domains in your CFD model in order to, to model them. On the other side, we're trying to model a lot of this, these turbulent eddies, and these turbulent eddies are quite small. Um, and you need to make sure that when you are uh, discretizing your, your domain uh, into lots of little cells, you, your cells are small enough to capture all those tiny, tiny little eddies that are going on. So you might end up with domains that are hundreds of meters in every direction, but you're trying to discretize it down into kind of half meter cubes. And so you end up with some really big meshes going on, or you can do very easily. Um, the other challenge uh, is in, in the time domain. So a lot of these tiny eddies tend to oscillate and fluctuate quite quickly. So that means you need quite a small time step in your CFD simulation. Contrasting to that, you also need to simulate a reasonable amount of flow time because your pilot needs to be able to fly through this air wake in order to land. So you can't just do a quick short snippet of, of flow, you need a sensible amount of time. And those two things together um, end up with a meaning you have a simulation with lots of time steps. So now we're in this interesting place where we've got some really big models going on and we're needing to run them for lots and lots of time steps. And ultimately that means huge amounts of data being generated. Um, and you know, we've run a few of these projects. Uh, typically when we run one of them, it's not unusual for us to be generating kind of tens of terabytes of data. Um, so that kind of data management in and of itself is a really interesting challenge uh, before you even get into the details of a simulation. So that's a, a quick run through of kind of flight simulators and some of the challenges. Um, they're obviously got some really nice benefits over physical flight trials, um, but there are some really interesting modeling challenges and just some data management challenges which you need to think about. Um, I wanted to go on now to talk around something that we're going to call the pilot workload proxy. Um, and the real idea behind this is actually, can we predict how difficult a pilot is going to find a landing? Um, because if we can do that and we can predict that, then actually we don't necessarily need to go to all this effort of running a physical trial or a simulated trial and maybe we can cut the pilot out of this bit entirely. Um, fortunately there's been some really good work uh, that's been done by the, uh, the CAA um, and uh, I'm quoting here from a paper that was kind of put out in about 2009. I think the original research kind of predated that. Um, but what was done in this study was they used a flight simulator trial uh, to assess pilot workload. So just like the flight simulators we've just been talking about. Um, but then what they were able to do is compare that reported pilot workload to the turbulence over the heli deck. Uh, and what they were able to demonstrate was actually a really strong correlation uh, between the pilot workload and what we call the standard deviation of vertical velocity. So this is kind of the vertical up and down fluctuations that occur uh, in the turbulence. And what you're seeing on the left there is a high level summary of all that study. So on the Y axis, you've got pilot workload. Uh, and on the X axis, you've got this standard deviation of vertical velocity, which you can just think of as, as turbulence. And you've got this really nice correlation going on. Um, they've obviously run this trial for a number of different pilots. And because this pilot workload uh, metric is quite subjective, you obviously end up with um, differences between pilots or even uh, quite a lot of scatter within a particular pilot's uh, judgment as well. But there is also a really clear correlation there, which is great. And then, then what we're able to do actually say, uh, let's set a safe limit. So let's say we don't want the pilot to work uh, workload to be higher than 5.5 because that's the limit at which we feel like stuff st starts to get a bit close to the wire and, uh, and we don't want to go over that and actually once you've got that you and you've got your nice correlation what drops out of that is a really nice limit on your your acceptable level of turbulence so in this case uh, 1.75 meters per second uh, as a limit of your standard deviation of vertical velocity Actually, that's really important because we've taken this kind of slightly nebulous, uh, very human factors um, metric of pilot workload and, uh, and turned it into something actually which is really quantifiable that we can get out of modeling and simulation or, or indeed test. Um, there's one other set of limits here which I just want to talk around, which I've called the exhaust plume limits. Uh, and these are some extra limits that the CAA um, kind of put in place. Uh, these effectively say we don't want uh, exhaust plumes to increase the temperature over the heli deck by more than two degrees, uh, and we don't want uh, there to be more than a certain percentage of hydrocarbons over the heli deck. Um, and again, that's very much a, 
um, a, an aircraft engine uh, safety factor. So once you start exceeding that, you can start to put the, the aircraft itself at risk. Um, but this guidance that was kind of uh, put together by the CA or, or, or this work forms part of uh, a lot of the industry guidance. So there's CAP 437, which is just standard for offshore heli deck landing areas, which governs, governs most offshore heli decks, um, except for those that are in your kind of red ensign uh, group yacht code, which typically covers kind of your large passenger yachts and your large yachts. So this is great. We've got some really nice quantifiable metrics um, that we can use to kind of predict that pilot workload. Um, how might we actually go about it in practice? And I just want to cover briefly kind of three different ways. And actually, the first one isn't a modeling and simulation based one. Uh, it's a measurement one, because uh, this is typically how stuff was done um, in the past uh, with wind and water tunnel measurements. Uh, and obviously there, what you would do is you would take a scale model of your platform and you'd put it in your wind or water tunnel and you would explicitly measure uh, the turbulence over your heli deck in that model. Uh, and that's great. That's uh, you're explicitly modeling some uh, some velocity fluctuations. So you have quite a high level of confidence in that. But there's a few challenges with wind and water tunnel measurements. Um, and the first one is that actually you have to run these at scale. So you can't put a hundred meter uh, model in a wind tunnel. That doesn't work. You have to run it at scale. And that propose, uh, that um, creates some really interesting challenges, particularly when it comes to modeling things like hot plumes, where buoyancy is really important and you just can't get all the scaling right. So in your wind and water tunnel, you typically can't ever quite measure what you're gonna see in reality. One of the other challenges of, of the wind and water tunnels is that you typically only have results at a few specific instrumented locations. So particular points where you might have hot wire uh, probes, for example. Uh, and so you, while you have a lot of detail at those points, you don't get that big picture uh, image of what the airway uh, is looking like. And the other factor is that it can be quite expensive to run these tests. So you have to physically build the model to put in your wind tunnel, um, but then you also have to have tunnel time. Uh, and these facilities are um, relatively limited. There's not an infinite number of them. Um, and so actually getting tunnel time can be quite a challenge. So um, I'm absolutely not knocking wind and water tunnel measurements. They're really important, um, but there are some really interesting benefits once you move across to the modeling and simulation space. Um, and there's two flavors of simulation that we're going to look at. The first one I'm going to call a uh, transient simulation. Um, and for those of you with a bit of CFD background, this is typically uh, large eddy simulation type uh, models. Um, and one of the nice benefits of these models, um, these are effectively the same ones that we ran in for the flight simulator. Uh, you are explicitly modeling all that turbulence. So you're explicitly modeling all the little fluctuations that are going on uh, in your airway. Um, but one of the nice benefits is that unlike a, a physical test, you can run this test at scale. You can run a model of a 300 meter long ship, no problem. And the other benefit is that, as you can see in the image here, uh, you get results for the full flow field. So you really get a, a good sense of what's going on over the flight deck in a way that you probably can't do very well with wind and water tunnel measurements. Um, one of the downsides to these types of simulations, as we've talked about before, is that they are computationally expensive. Um, and even if you weren't doing the flight simulator and generating all that data, there's still quite a lot of compute uh, effort that goes into them. So what are the alternatives? Well, the alternative is something that you might call a steady state simulation. Uh, and again, for uh, those of you with a bit of CFD knowledge, these would typically be your Reynolds average Navier Stokes type uh, uh, models. Um, one of the challenges of these models is actually they don't explicitly model the turbulence. They only deal in st statistical measures of that turbulence. So you don't see all the little up and down fluctuations going on. You just get a parameter that tells you how big those fluctuations kind of are. Um, but actually, that's not too bad for us because our the, the proxy metric that we care about uh, is, in fact, uh, a statistical measure. It's a standard deviation of vertical uh, velocity. So actually, we can make use of these models quite nicely. Uh, and they also have a lot of the benefits of, of the other models in that you can run them at full scale and results are available for your full flow field. Uh, and on top of that, they are much computationally cheaper than your than your transient simulation. So that makes them really quite attractive. So how would you actually go about using your simulations to define that operating limit? Um, what you typically do is you define a little bit of a volume above your heli deck uh, and you'd run your CFD simulations and you'd look at what was going on in that particular bit of bit of uh, the flow field 
and you just ask the question, are my turbulence limits or my exhaust plume limits exceeded over the heli deck, yes or no? And if you start to run a few of these simulations, you can start to build up a picture of where that safe operating limit is. And you would typically represent those operating limits on something that looks a bit like this. So if you start with a diagram on, on the left, uh, this is just a polar plot with relative wind speed along the radial axis uh, and relative wind direction uh, around the polar plot. And you run a load of simulations to kind of try and fill that in. And then you start blocking off areas where your limits are exceeded. So on the middle chart here, you've got um, a big red area where we're saying in these areas, our turbulence limits are exceeded. We don't want to operate there. Um, and in that blue region, you've got uh, uh, exhaust plume limits being exceeded. So we don't want to operate in there. And then, of course, you just take the inverse of that, which is what we're seeing on the, the graph on the right. So as long as you're operating in that kind of green uh, envelope of safe operation, you're good to go. But as soon as you start straying outside that, you'll, you'll be exceeding one or other of your safe operating limits. Um, so that's really good. So we've, we've now got a way of defining some safe operation uh, limits through modeling and simulation. Um, but this leads on to a really important question around what are the wind conditions? Um, and that's because when we define uh, these operating limits, in order for them to be of any use at all whatsoever, the operator of your ship or your platform needs to know what the wind conditions are because they need to know whether you're inside your safe operating envelope or not. Uh, and I'm going to refer to you here a lot around what I call the true wind conditions. So the wind conditions that are occurring away from your platform um, outside of its influence as if it wasn't there. Um, and in order to try and measure that, some of the CAP 437 guidance recommends you would place your anemometers at the highest practical point uh, on your platform. Um, so that's typically the Derrick or Telecom's mast. Uh, and for those of you that don't speak oil and gas, the Derrick is, is that uh, generally the big tall tower in the middle of your platform. Um, it's a similar story around naval ships. So you would typically place uh, anemometers relatively high up the main mast, as high as you can practically get them. Uh, and all of this is in an effort to get the anemometers away from the platform as far as you can. So in, a, in an attempt to measure that free stream unrestricted airflow. And in, in, in principle, that's great. Um, but there's some really interesting challenges in practice. And that's, again, that these platforms are so big. Um, so the, 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 where you end up with is, is that you can't get your anemometer far enough away from your platform. It's just not practical. Uh, and here's a typical example of what you might see. Um, so we've got a, an image of a ship on the left with the air wake around it. And you might have uh, an anemometer placed you know, just off uh, on, on the port side of the main mast. And what you're seeing in the diagram on the left here is that your true wind conditions, the ones that you would uh, describe as the wind conditions, uh, are uh, around 315 degrees and at a particular wind speed. Actually, your anemometer is still within kind of being influenced by the ship. And so actually where, where it's located, the wind speed is slightly slower and it's much more um, uh, more like a zero degrees type wind, much more like head on. And so now you've got an anemometer which can't measure the true wind conditions, which is a bit of a, a, an interesting challenge and a bit of a risk. Um, and you might say, well, actually, I can just stick, I'll just stick a second anemometer on and surely one of those will be right. But actually, you can, in some ways, you make that problem worse. So you, here we've put an anemometer off uh, the starboard side of the main mast. But actually, this anemometer also isn't outside the influence of the ship's air wake. So that one says the wind speed's a bit higher uh, and is much more like a, a wind from the broadside. Uh, and now you've got an interesting uh, situation where one anemometer is telling you that you're OK and the other one is telling you that you're not OK. And uh, if you're on a ship, you you have to leave it up to some human to judge what they think the real wind speed actually is. Do they trust one anemometer or the other, or do they kind of compromise between the two? Uh, and there's obviously a huge risk associated with that. Fortunately, there's a, a really nice answer to this, uh, this problem. Uh, and fortunately, we've done all the hard work already in doing the simulations. Um, uh, and what you typically do is you'd look at your ship and you'd run CFD simulations uh, for you know, different wind directions. But those CFD simulations uh, will tell you uh, what the error in your anemometer is. So you can look at those simulations and they will say that an anemometer in this location will be out by X degrees uh, in the wind direction or by X knots in the wind speed. And actually, you, you, all you need to do is reverse engineer that problem, flip it upside down, and you can end up with these corrections, which we've kind of illustrated on the right. So 
then once you've got that information, you, you measure uh, something with your anemometer. And depending on what you measure, you apply a wind direction correction uh, and a wind speed correction. And it gets you back to this idea of the true wind speed, the one that you really care about. So that brings us to the end of that section. So we've, we've now got uh, quite a nice position where we can use some modeling and simulation to drive some limits. Uh, we can also use modeling and simulation to help correct for kind of anemometer um, errors uh, and get back to a point where we can make use of those, those uh, operating limits defined with modeling and simulation. Um, so I just wanted to finish off um, by very briefly kind of looking to the future uh, and where, uh, what's the direction of travel in this space? Where are we heading? Um, and before I uh, go any further, I just want to introduce one more concept, which is, is this idea of wind gusts. Um, so this is, uh, it, the wind is never stationary in reality. It's always kind of meandering around and changing. Uh, and if you're operating uh, close to the edge of your, your operating envelope, sometimes that those wind conditions might stray outside your operating envelope and sometimes they'll be inside it. And really the question we're trying to ask here is, can we make use of that safe operating period in between these uh, gusts of wind? Um, and so this was um, a project that we've been working on with the University of Exeter. Um, I'm just going to cover it very briefly here. Um, there's loads of stuff going on behind this, obviously. Um, but the way kind of the system works that we've we've been able to demonstrate is you would use a LIDAR, um, which is a type of laser uh, mounted on the front of your platform, and you can use that to scan ahead uh, and measure what the wind is doing. Um, once you've got that measurement of wind, uh, the wind field, you can actually make a wind forecast. So you can predict what the wind conditions are going to be at your vessel for the next maybe 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever it is. And of course, once you've got your wind forecast, you can then go on uh, to make an air weight prediction and start to assess some of these uh, risk metrics. Uh, so some of these kind of pilot workload proxy type uh, type numbers. Uh, and we were actually fortunate enough in this project to actually uh, have some real data from a, from a ship trial. Uh, and we have been able to kind of demonstrate this as a proof of concept, which is really nice. Um, so that's uh, just a brief project that we looked at in terms of predicting stuff. Um, but I just wanted to finish by talking around the next big challenge in this space, which is absolutely around uh, autonomous systems. And actually that uh, kind of prediction stuff, while it has implications for manned uh, operations, is was really designed to help try and solve uh, part of this autonomous systems challenge. Uh, and, and the real challenge here is that we rely so heavily on the pilot at the moment in terms of being able to make uh, sensible decisions. So the pilot is taking in all these various inputs from exhaust plumes and turbulent airflow, poor visibility, moving heli deck, and they are processing that in their brains somehow in a way that they've learned to do in training, and they're applying some appropriate um, uh, control inputs. And the answer and the question here is really how on earth do you replace that system once you start taking the pilot out the loop how do you make sure that your autonomous system always responds in a safe and reliable way uh, and that's a real challenge it's a topic of, of uh, very much a topic of ongoing research at the moment there aren't really any answers to that and it, it's something the industry is definitely having to uh, start to tackle so uh, just by way of uh, summary then so um We've talked around this idea of flight simulators and how they're a kind of cost effective alternative to physical flight trials, uh, but they do require some uh, modeling of some complex aerodynamic interactions, uh, as well uh, as sometimes resulting in some very large data sets, which can be a bit of an interesting challenge. Um, we talked a little bit around this idea of pilot workload proxy uh, and how that can be used to define some safe operating envelopes based on uh, some relatively simple CFD simulations. Uh, and then we talked around uh, the idea of knowing the wind conditions and actually how that's a really critical part of actually being able to make use of any of these operating limits uh, which have been defined by flight simulators or, or the pilot workload proxy uh, and actually how we can address that problem with the CFD simulations themselves. Uh, we then kind of looked at that kind of predictive system uh, and these types of systems which are being used to kind of further extend that safe operating envelope. Uh, and then finished on on a bit of a cliffhanger around these autonomous systems and the, the challenge that they pose at the moment and the rethink that is, is required, particularly around how do you make sure that your autonomous system uh, is always going to respond in a way that is kind of safe and reliable. Um, so that kind of brings me to the end, end of the slides. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that, uh, that people have. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Chris. That was a very clear and interesting uh, presentation. Um, we so we <clears throat> we do have some questions coming in, but just to remind everyone that there's still opportunity to ask questions if you if you have them using the ask a question box on the interface. Um, but I'll I'll start off. Um, you you've mentioned there. Uh, so the question here you've mentioned. There's different types of CFD simulations that you can use to assess the pilot workload. How would you typically choose between those um, different types of simulation for each project? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting um, question. And I think it effectively comes down to a, uh, a risk-based decision and the level of risk uh, and conservatism you're willing to carry. So if you're kind of a, a typical kind of heli deck on an oil and gas rig, actually you might be happy with those uh, relatively simple simulations that uh, give you a very conservative operating envelope and that's fine uh, you might find that your heli deck is a bit different there's something unique about it or perhaps you're really trying to get a bit more um, uh, operational envelope out of it and actually that might be a, a good time to move to that more uh, complex level of simulations where you might have a bit more confidence in the results um, and then obviously if you're really trying to push things um, you might move towards those flight simulators. Uh, and I think that autonomous systems uh, challenge is a really good example of the flight simulators in particular, because a lot of these metrics that have been developed in the past are very pilot dominated. So that it's all around understanding the pilot workload. And that isn't really applicable when you go to an unmanned system. So then that's a really good opportunity to kind of make use of flight simulators. Thank you. Um... A question from Owen, <clears throat> how do you validate your models? Yeah, that, that's a really important question, obviously. So um, any any number of ways you can do that. So uh, if you have a wind tunnel, we talked around wind tunnel and water tunnel stuff. Um, if you have wind tunnel measurements, you can absolutely validate models uh, against wind tunnel data or water tunnel data. Um, for a lot of the models we do for uh, various navies, uh, they will have uh, data from trials that they've done on the ship, so actual full-scale trials, and that's really valuable. Um, I think um, there's an interesting question here, though, because at some point, in order to get that validation data, you're having to do a lot of these physical trials, which we're saying we kind of want to avoid with the modeling and simulation. I think, again, it comes back to that level of risk. And actually, we're, I think we're now getting to a point where we're, there's a lot more trust in some of the modeling and simulation work that's going on. Um, and actually we're getting to a point where people are willing to put a bit more credence to that and trust it and wait until the design is built and then just do a final kind of quick test. Um, but that's very much a kind of a, a journey that's going on. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Um, next question from Merv. Um, was the MCAS system in the Boeing 737 MAX an example of an autonomous system? Uh, that's uh, an interesting question. Um, was it autonomous? I don't know. I think the issue with that, from my understanding of the situation, was it was just a very badly designed system with a single point of failure. Um, so I, it certainly wasn't like they had a piece of code. Well, I guess we did have a piece of code controlling stuff, but it was just very poorly designed. Okay. Do uh, ask any further questions if anyone has any. Um, so yeah, I just had a, a question. So we focused on, on the pilot workload there and kind of how you can assess safe limits. Would, would this also be used in designing new structures, you know, to, to, to actually allow for this and, and maybe to widen that sort of safe operating window? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's not just used to define stuff. You can use it during design, and that's becoming much more commonplace. So uh, we've, we've done a number of pieces of work where you kind of do the assessment of the initial design. You find that there's actually there's going to be a real issue at these particular wind conditions because of, I don't know, the placement of the exhaust plumes or some structures. And actually, you feed that back into design and can start to iterate um, until you get to a level where you're happy with uh, kind of your, your heli deck availability. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's something you, you can do. Great. Uh, oh yeah, so another question from Owen just popped up. Um, have you any real life examples of where you've been able to use this method um, to achieve 
SIA, SAI certification and or develop SHOLs? Share shoals, so share, oh, ship yeah. helicopter operating limits, I think it is. Um, uh, yes, so we've been working with, um, uh, like I say, a number of navies, and um, this, some of the airway work we're doing is uh, embedded into flight simulators and those simulators are being used uh, on various for various platforms to develop new shoals uh, for those aircraft it's still that's still very much a um, early days type um, situation so uh, there is we're still going through that loop of making sure we're happy with the level of fidelity and quite what that certification process is going to look like and what you need to absolutely get right in that uh, and what's okay to to trust in. I think all those kind of questions are kind of ongoing, but yes, these are being used to develop uh, develop shoals and, and SAI certification. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I guess a related question, are there examples you can share uh, where the use of modeling and simulation has been used to deliver an in-service ship air release? Oh, um, that's an interesting one. Um, I think probably the closest one I, I can think of um, for in-service ship, um, is there were often when you've got an in-service ship, um, you are you might run it for a bit and then you might make modifications to that. Um, and if you're not careful, you'll end up making modifications to the superstructure of your um, ship, which will impact all this nice work you've done in defining the shoals. So if you suddenly stick a new block of instrumentation somewhere, you can suddenly change your air wake uh, and that can invalidate your shoals. Um, and there's been one, one bit of work in particular we were involved in where basically there was a bit of a, a a challenge going on in that they were going to put this piece of equipment on there and someone said well actually we don't have any evidence to say uh, that's going to be okay from a shoals point of view and one option was just to say okay we're just going to reduce our operating envelope and live with it um, but actually in that case we were able to use modeling and simulation to kind of um, demonstrate the impact of this new structure was actually pretty minimal um, and they were happy to proceed on that basis. It's not quite the full ship air release, but it is kind of part of that process. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from anybody? Please, please I'll just give you a few moments to pop them in the chat, just in case there's any, any further questions. Okay, it looks like we've... Um, satisfies everybody's questions so um i'll take the opportunity to thank you very much chris for a very interesting talk um thanks for all the preparation that you've put into this uh, and thank you everybody for for attending okay, thank you mark okay i think that's as they say that's all folks um see you on the, on the next webinar <laughs>